Your dream is possible. But not only is it important that you believe and begin to know that it's possible for you to live your dream as you run toward it, but I've done something that I want to share with you called Choosing Your Future. In fact, I've developed a set of tapes talking about how to begin to create your own reality by choosing your future. And not only is it important for you to know it's possible for you to choose your future, but it's necessary that you work on yourself, that you develop yourself. It's necessary that you get the energy drainers out of your life, people who don't want anything, people who are not striving, people who are not challenging themselves, people who aren't growing, people who have stopped dreaming. It's necessary that you align yourself with people and attract people into your business who are hungry, people who are unstoppable and unreasonable, people who are refusing to leave life just as it is and who want more. My mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. If you run around with losers, you will end up a loser. It's necessary that you get the losers out of your life if you want to live your dream. It's necessary to know that everybody won't see it, that everybody won't join you, that everybody won't have the vision. It's necessary to know that, that a lot of people like to complain, but they don't want to do anything about their situation, that you are an uncommon breed. You know, you have to know within yourself that I can do this. Even if no one else sees it for me, I must see it for myself. That's necessary. It's also, ladies and gentlemen, necessary that you be creative when you're working on your ideas, that you understand the importance of, of changing up, of readjusting your strategies. Many times we can have a great idea, but if you're not advancing it in the right way and things don't happen, you become discouraged and think the idea doesn't work. No, that's not true. It's necessary that we become creative. I remember when I was in New York walking down the street and a guy approached me and said, hey, mister, can I shine your shoes? And I said, no, I'm in a hurry. I don't have time. I kept walking. Someone else said, hey, man, your shoes look cluddy. May I shine your shoes? I said, no, I don't have time. I'm sorry, I'm busy. And I was walking fast and many people solicited me for my business. And then finally, a young man stepped in front of me and he said, excuse me. And he started counting, 97, 98, 99, 100. He said, sir. I said, yes. He said, come here, please. I said, what is it? He said, today is my birthday. And every year, just to thank God for another year of life, the 100th person who passes by shoeshine stand, I offer them a free shoeshine. Would you give me the honors? I said, why, sure. I got up on the shoeshine stand, George, and I sat there and, and he shined my shoes diligently. And when I got down, I looked at him, they were sparkly. And I was walking away and I said, thank you. And I stopped, I said, excuse me, but how much do you usually charge? He said, only $2. I said, I tell you what, today's your birthday. Here's five, keep the change. He said, thank you. As I was walking away, looking in the opposite direction of other people coming, he started counting again. 97, 98, 99, 100. It's hard to find a mentor that's got all the qualities. Somebody mentors you in good health. Somebody mentors you in spirituality. Somebody mentors you in business and career. Somebody mentors you in friendship. It's hard to find it all in one package. But you know, genius comes in strange packages sometimes with their idiosyncrasies. If we could have lived around some of the geniuses of the past, Leonardo, I mean, he might have been impossible to live with, right? But he had this incredible genius. So sometimes you got to look past the idiosyncrasies and faults and not look so much at the strange package that this genius came in, but to appreciate the genius. Unless it's totally intolerable, and some have lived fairly almost intolerable lives, right? But they had this genius. The life of Van Gogh. I mean, this was a strange character, right? He cut off his own ear. He had some torments. But his irises now sell for, what, 40 million or something? We now consider him a genius. It was a rather strange package. And then I found that geniuses have no sense of time. If you would have had a chance to meet Michelangelo, and Michelangelo says, why don't you come and see me work? Say, okay, I'll come tomorrow morning. And you get there, you know, eight, nine o'clock. And he's been there since four. And he tells you, I got here a long time ago. And you say, well, isn't that early to go to work? And he says, early, early. What does early mean? And maybe it's 10 o'clock at night, and you know, he's still chipping away at something, right? His genius is working. You say, Michelangelo, isn't it a little late? He says, late? What does late mean? I don't comprehend. What does that mean, late? So it is true. You have to sort of tolerate the inconsistencies of some very remarkable people who have much to share. Too bad about my friend and my mentor, Earl Schof. You know, he drank champagne every day. You know, champagne's okay, but not every day. And he smoked his camels. He was not a chain smoker, but pretty close. Back when the packages didn't say, these things will kill you. So 
what are you going to do? So he smoked his camels and drank his champagne. And on that, he miscalculated. For all of his other wisdom and uniqueness, he miscalculated on his champagne and his camels. He just didn't have any concept that they were going to kill him, at least that early, age 49. So that taught me as well. You got to take a look at all the systems and make sure you're not a bit disillusioned by something that can someday shorten your life or do you in or wreck your enterprise or disengage your marriage or whatever. You got to keep looking at everything. Carelessness and casualness sometimes creates casualties, both on the freeway and in business, marriage, friendship. My advice started long ago, I think, when I said, be a student, not a follower. I mentioned in one of my seminars, I seek no disciples, you know, I'm not looking for a following. I just want to find people who want to share good ideas, come together and let me share my experiences and see if that's valuable. Personally, I wouldn't be so enamored, I think, by someone as to sort of make them a god and make myself a disciple. I would not do that. Only the Lord's disciple. Because on the radical side, it can cause trouble, you know. You wind up in a fire in Waco, Texas. Koresh and his followers. So that's the radical extreme. Let me quickly give you now a list of the skills that changed my life forever. Developing a new philosophy that I could do it in my network marketing experience now led me to developing new skills. Right, I knew how to milk cows, but didn't pay well. Here's the first skill I learned to change my life. Getting a customer, making a sale. If you share a unique product, talk about its merits, persuade someone that it's the best, they agree to buy, that's the simple art of sales. So we're not talking like high-powered spacecraft technical skills here. It's simply sharing something you've discovered with someone else and doing it well enough to where they agree they would like to participate. Now here's what happened when I learned sales. It multiplied my income by five. Now it didn't take that much because I wasn't doing that well in farm country, but it did multiply my income by five. Sales, getting customers, laying that incredible foundation for an entrepreneurial career. So now I've got two skills, milking cows and making sales. Here's the next one I learned that changed me forever, and that's recruiting, introducing the business opportunity to new people, learning how to give a good invitation, learning how to give two kinds of presentation, formal and informal. And the third part of recruiting, of course, is following up. Once you start a new life, now you gotta take care of it, like a new mother would take care of her baby. You don't start a new life and abandon it. You start a new life and nourish it like a mother, protect it like a father. You gotta be both mother and father to a new person. Nourishment, ideas like a mother. Protection, help defend your new life against the encroachment of outside voices that would try to talk them out of it. So you gotta be mother and father in this art of recruiting. We call it being a sponsor. And being a sponsor is like being a bridge, helping somebody from darkness to light, from skeptic to faith, from not knowing to knowing, from no confidence in themselves to starting to gain confidence. You're the bridge that helps people from the shadows to the sunlight. It's one of the most exciting positions to occupy in all of network marketing industry, is the bridge, helping people crossing the bridge out from discouragement into recognition. Being this bridge, that's what the recruiting magic is all about. You've got the answers. They've been looking for the answers. You've got the answers and you help them cross this bridge. You see something in them before they can see it in themselves. You assure them that it's possible to be more than they are. Therefore, they can earn more than they've got, have more than they possess. This is one of the great arts in the world. And here's what's exciting about this art. It pays big money because now you operate a unique philosophy taught first in the Bible because the question was asked, how can we achieve greatness, great wealth, great power, great influence, great recognition, great self-esteem? How can we achieve greatness? The master teacher was asked and here was his formula for achieving personal greatness. He said, find a way to serve the many for service to many leads to greatness for those that are interested. Some people aren't interested, but for those that are, service to many leads to greatness. Someone says, well, best I can do is just take care of myself, which is okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Someone says, I got enough bills of my own, I can't worry about someone else's bills. That's okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Greatness is helping people pay their bills, you forget about yours. Because if you help enough people pay theirs, yours disappear. Help people with problems, your problems disappear. The key to greatness, the master teacher taught, is finding a way. Now, a lot of people would like to serve many people, but they don't have a way. And what's exciting about you and your business is, you've now got the way. Whether you use it or not, it's up to you. Whether you cash it in or not, it's up to you. Whether you make a fortune or just a little, that's all up to you. Each person's ambition, it's called the same marketing, the same product. These products are the same for everybody here. They're 
Marketing system is the same. The difference is each person's philosophy and each person's individual ambition. But whatever your ambitions are, now you've got the ways and means. And here's what you've got the ways and means to do. Serve as many people as you would like. Now here's what's exciting about recruiting. With what you're involved in here, you can directly and indirectly affect the lives of dozens of people. Some of you are going to directly and indirectly affect the lives of hundreds of people. And some of you, if you wish, can directly and indirectly affect the lives of thousands of people. And the pay is accordingly. If you affect a few, you earn that pay. If you affect the many, you earn that pay. But the secret is found in the Bible. Service to many leads to greatness. Now, John Kennedy said it in his inaugural speech. Here's what he said. Don't ask. Don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? John Kennedy said, don't ask. That's important if you understand philosophy. He said, don't ask what the people can do for you. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Don't ask what the government can do for you. That's not how you get rich. That's not how you have high self-esteem. That's not how you get trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace, asking what the people can do for you. Don't ask, he said, what the people can do for you, but ask, what could I do for my country? And the country means the people. What could I do for the people? I want trophies. I want recognition. I want high self-esteem. I would even like a chance to make a fortune. John Kennedy says it's easy. Don't ask what the people can do for you, but ask, what could I do for the people. Could I directly and indirectly serve many in my country? And now that you are participating in this program, the answer is yes. Now, Zig probably said it best. Zig's got some great uh, Zig and I have been good friends for a lot of years. Zig says money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. <laughs> Zig, you're right. Zig says, my dentist told me, Zig, only floss the teeth you want to keep. You know, forget the rest. But here, Zig is famous for this now. This is one of Zig's philosophies, and it goes right along with the other two, the Bible and John Kennedy. Here's what Zig says. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, wanting everything you want, we call that self-interest. But it's okay to have self-interest if you do it in a positive way. By helping enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, you can accomplish all that by learning this next skill called recruiting. And I learned it, and it made me fortune. So now I've got three skills, milking cows, making sales, and recruiting. Here's the next skill I learned that paid big money, organizing. Once you got a few, get them to work together, see, and that's magic. Getting people to work together is magic. Now, yes, it's challenging, like having some, you know, several in members of your family getting them to work together is challenging, but it's magic. Getting husband and wife to work together is challenging, but it's magic when it happens. But everything magic is challenging. You just got to jot that down. Everything magic is challenging. But once you figure out the challenge and go for it, then the magic occurs. Let me tell you how magical people working together is. Let me quote the Bible again. It says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Just try that on for your mental size. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. Everybody's looking for a challenge. Here's what I teach, especially the kids. Here's the best challenge in the world. Let's go do it. Not you go do it. Let's go do it. If two or three of us decide on a common purpose to do it, nothing's impossible. Incredible. Working together, organizing. Now, when everybody's an independent, now it's a little more challenging. Like having kids, they've each got their own opinions. They've each got their own ambitions and desires. It, it's, it's challenging. You've got a variety. But that's what makes life the variety. Getting people to work together. It's like herding cats. You know, sheep are easy. Sheep are easy. But you got to try cats. Herding cats. But if you can possibly get it done, the power is so immense when you get people to work together. Here's one of the powers of working together, shared testimonials. If I've got somebody new and you're there and I'm there, I give them my testimonial, you give your testimonial. Maybe what tips the scales in getting me a new person is not my testimonial, but my partner's testimonial, somebody I'm working with. Their testimonial got them. Shared testimonials are so powerful. That's why working together is powerful. Now, working by yourself is okay. All this stuff is okay. Everybody needs to know, though, where are the advantages? And these are some of the advantages. I learned to organize, paid big money. Here's what I next learned to do. Promote. Promotion now pays staggering money. Here's one of the secrets. Rewarding people for small steps of progress. Rewarding people. Sometimes it's just recognition, handshake, pat on the back. Mary, you're doing a fabulous job. And you figure out what those recognitions are. Small steps of progress. Guess what promotion pays if you learn it well? Big money. Getting people to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do by themselves. People will do some unique things by themselves, but if you can figure out a way to say, Mary, if you do this and this, she says, well, I'll go for it. Now, she wouldn't have thought of that on her own. Here's what works magic. It's better than money. Money is a bit unimportant. Here's what's important. 
ingenuity. The best place to wake up your ingenuity is what you're doing right now. Representing a unique product and getting customers, recruiting distributors and promoting and all this stuff. Ingenuity. Figuring out a way. If it doesn't work this way, we'll work another way. I used my ingenuity and made a fortune. My ingenuity worked on doing all these campaigns, the spring campaign and the summer campaign and the winter campaign. This week we're going to recruit school teachers. How many of you got? How many of you got? School. This is school teacher week. School teacher month. I pick out a little category and say, let's go for it. And it doesn't matter what it is. Just dream up something so that somebody's got a little more objective to go for than just their own. Key phrase. We all need to belong to something bigger than ourselves because we furnish inspiration for what's bigger and the bigger furnishes inspiration for us. I learned promotion and it paid big money. Here's next I learned. Communication, how to conduct a meeting. I learned identification, logic and reason, attack and confess, solution. Simple deals on communication. Wasn't easy for me at first. I stood up to give my first presentation, my mind sat back down. Right? Y'all been through that? Opened my mouth, nothing came out for a while. But here's what I did. I did it again. Just jot that phrase down. I did it again. That's the secret to how I got here. 35, 40 years later, that's how I got here. I did it once, it was uncomfortable. That first presentation was so lousy, if I hadn't have been doing it, I'd have gone home. <laughs> it was not that good. But here's the secret to how I got here. I did it again, and then I did it again, and then I did it again, and I did it again. I remember when I first decided to be a little more animated, right? And walk out away from the podium, right? Get out from just behind the podium. So I got out there, and then I thought, how do you get back? <laughs> Whoa, I'm stranded out here. <laughs> Remember those times? Doing something for the first time? But you learn quickly in your business, right? In your business, a guy stands up to give his first testimonial. And he's so nervous, he forgets his own name, right? <laughs> and 30 days later, he wants to give a three-hour testimonial, right? You hardly get him off the stage. So, learn communication. How to affect other people with words. That's the greatest art in the world to learn. How to affect other people with words. Key phrase, don't be lazy in language. If you learn to use the gift of your own language wisely, it can make you a fortune and build an incredible life. Here's three other things I learned. One is to train. Training people how the business works. And then I've used another word called teach. Train and teach. And only to say this. Training people how the business works. Teaching is how life works. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century. Business skills and life skills. The life skills are leadership skills. The life skills are learning how to set goals. Now here's the ultimate skill to learn that can transform your life and the life of whoever will listen. The ability to inspire. Inspire means help people to look up a little higher than where they are and wish they could get there. And inspire them that it's possible. Here's how we inspire by our own testimony. If I can do it, you can do it. Here's how else we inspire by others' testimonial. If they can do it, Mary, you can do it. Getting people to see themselves better than they are. Getting people to see themselves richer than they are. Getting people to see themselves more capable next year than they are this year. Getting to see themselves in the future. To help both your kids and your people. Here's what you must learn to do. Number one, help people to see themselves as they are. If people have made mistakes, they gotta know it. You can't go on making mistakes and hope to achieve. Mistakes have to be corrected. And you've got to do it with your children. Help them to see themselves as they are. If they've messed up, here's what you've got to say. You've messed up. But here's what's important as a parent, don't leave them in the mess. Some parents tell their kids they've messed up and then they leave them in the mess. They don't paint a better picture. Here's what you could become with just a couple of more changes. Rather than this, here's what you could be. So we must help our children see themselves as they are, but here's the greatest gift, to help our children see themselves better than they are. To transport them not only past to see their mistakes, but transport them to the future to see their opportunity to see the person they can become. My mentor had that greatest gift to help me to see myself better than I was. At first it was difficult to see, then I started to believe, and that's how I got here today. He said, one of these days, Mr. Owen, you'll walk into a room full of people, and you will hear some of them say, that's him, that's the famous man. I, I said, well, that could never happen to me. He said, trust me, if you keep working hard on the disciplines like you're doing right now, that'll happen. Jot these notes down now on leadership. Here's the first one. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. Sometimes when we need other people in our enterprise, we go to work on them. When the real key is, first of all, to go to work on yourself and become an attractive person. Now, it's not a bad idea to ponder and think what would make me an attractive person. Here's one, a refinement of philosophy so that you really understand life and challenge to the best of your ability. Your philosophy about the marketplace and politics and government and the work ethic. Your philosophy of values and contributions. Your philosophy that understands 
Each of us need all of us, and all of us need each of us. Each value is important. The miracle of America is all the gifts that have been flowing in here for the last three, four hundred years, especially the last two hundred years. No country in the last six thousand years has become such a depository of the gifts of the world like America has the last two hundred years. There's been nothing like it in recorded history. So many of the gifts of the whole world deposited in one country. My grandparents came from Odessa, Russia. They were German, but you know, when Peter married Catherine all those years back, it opened up the door for a lot of the Germans to move to Russia. And they moved and taught the Russians farming methods. And my grandparents moved to the Ukraine, Odessa. When I lectured in Moscow, some came all the way from Odessa up to Moscow. Now they want me to come from Moscow down to Odessa. And my grandparents came from Odessa, came to America, settled in a place in central Washington where a lot of the Germans came and they called it Odessa. Odessa, Washington, named after Odessa, Ukraine. My grandfather served in the Tsar's army a long time ago. In the Tsar's army, they had this deal. Based on your deportment, you got certain points. And if you accumulated enough of these points, you got to put your name into a lottery. And my grandfather accumulated enough of these points based on his deportment in the Tsar's army and got to participate in the lottery. Guess what happened to those who won these lotteries that they held every once in a while? You got to pick up your family and go to America. And my grandfather won one of these lotteries in the Tsar's army, picked up his one son and his wife and moved to America, Odessa, Washington. And my father was born in Odessa, Washington. Interesting, huh? Wow. The gifts that we have in this country are so multiplied. People from all over the world have come here, and they didn't come empty-handed. They brought their recipes. They brought the work ethic. They brought the gift of language. They brought the gift of law. They brought the gift of music, the gift of medicine, the gift of healing. Wow. America is such a composite of all the gifts of the world. The ethnic streams that have been flowing in here have made us great. Ethnic cleansing. Where would we start? Amazing. Now here's what we need to do. Participate in the gifts that America has. Now here's the joy I have to go back where these gifts came from. That's why I love to go back to Italy and I love to go to Poland and I love to go to Czechoslovakia and I love to go to Israel and I love to go to all the places around the world to see where America came from. And then the gifts they brought here helped me to develop my gifts. Now I'm taking some of my gifts back to where it came from. Can you imagine the feeling of now making that transcontinental contribution? Because they came here, now I go there. It's big time for a farm kid from Idaho. But to attract attractive people, you must be attractive now, working hard on yourself. Jot this down. Leadership is really the challenge to be something better than mediocre, something better than average. The step above, not just to be above from ego standpoint, but the step above so you can help someone else. What speaker was it that said in order to lift someone up, you must be on higher ground? How true. And the challenge of leadership to be something more than average or mediocre has these components. Make this list. This is a good list. Learn to be strong, but not rude. Strength we need, rudeness we don't need. Here's where it's important to learn the graces, not just the skill. Next, be kind, but not weak. Sometimes it's easy to mistake weakness for kindness, but not true. Kindness is a powerful strength, but don't let your kindness become weakness. Next, learn to be bold, but not a bully. Boldness we need, bully we don't need. Throwing weight around we don't need. Trying to impress we don't need. Express, yes, but impress, no. Next is to be thoughtful, but not lazy. To dream, but not just become a dreamer. To think, but not just become a thinker. To have a philosophy, but not to become just a philosopher. I know they call me, you know, the great business philosopher, which I, I like the title, it's okay. But my philosophy says, jot it down, results is the name of the game. The name of the game is not philosophy. Philosophy is just a useful tool to set you on a good track so that a year from now you'll be in a better place than you would have on the old track. Hopefully most everybody here, maybe everybody here is going to set a new track for your health and for your family and for your future and for your activity and for your productivity and for your spirituality and all the rest of good values. So be thoughtful but not lazy. Here's the next one. Be proud but not arrogant. Pride we need. Team pride and community pride and state pride and country pride and personal pride and family pride. 
but not arrogance. Don't let your pride slip into arrogance. Here's the next one. Be humble, but not timid. Some people mistake timidity for humility. But humility is a virtue. Timidity is an illness, a malady that can be corrected. You can learn to drive your timidity into such a small corner. It does not now disturb the rest of the house. Here's one more in terms of sophistication. Doesn't take much to learn and practice the art of sophistication. Here's a good one. Humor without folly. Humor has its place, but just don't cross the line so that your humor becomes folly. Next, it's okay to be witty, but not silly. If you want to lead as a parent and lead as a manager and lead as an entrepreneur, if you want to lead as a community leader and lead as a senator and lead as an important person of influence and power, witty, yes, silly, no. Next, every leader must understand the law of averages so you can use it for your benefit and for your company, anything you might be involved in. Here's what the law of averages says. If you do something often enough, you'll get a ratio of results. And anyone can create this ratio. In baseball, we simply call it batting average. If you go up to bat 10 times, get a hit, we say you're batting 100. Three hits out of 10, you're batting 300. You don't have to be perfect going up to bat these days. Batting 250, 300, you can make four or five million dollars a year. In sales, that's about all you got to do. You don't need to bat a thousand, right? You don't need to bat perfect. You can get plenty of no's, but the yeses can make you rich. So don't worry about the no's. Concentrate on the yeses that make you rich. The Israelites didn't have a chance. They didn't have food, equipment, supplies, strength, experience. But God is not limited by what you don't have. He's not intimidated by how big the opposition is, by how bad the medical report looks, by what the financial statement says. God multiplied the sound of these lepers' footsteps and caused this huge army to flee for their lives. They left in such a hurry, they didn't even take their belongings. They didn't even grab their tents. God knows how to quickly get rid of the opposition. Don't be discouraged by how permanent the obstacle looks or by how much bigger it seems in you. You have an advantage. The Most High God is on your side. He knows how to cause your enemies to hurry out of your way. Not gradually, not over a few months. You're about to see some things quickly turn around. Problems suddenly resolve. Enemies rapidly defeated. What's interesting is while the lepers were walking, they didn't know what God was doing. They couldn't hear what the enemy was hearing. Everything seemed normal to them, but God was doing something supernatural. You don't know what God is up to right now. While you're believing, while you're doing the right thing, everything may seem just the same, but God is talking to your enemies. He's causing them to hear what he wants them to hear. The Syrians didn't say to the lepers, okay, we'll leave. Just give us a few months to pack up our belongings. Give us some time to relocate. We need to find new property. They left suddenly in a panic. They were so afraid they fled for their lives. Some of the obstacles you're up against may seem like they have the upper hand. The sickness is bigger. You've had the addiction a long time. Feels like that trouble has you surrounded. But when it's your time, like with them, it's not going to leave gradually. It's not going to improve a little here, a little there. It's going to leave suddenly, like it's in a panic, like it's fleeing for its life. Well, Joel, this sounds encouraging, but I don't believe it's going to happen quickly for me. I've been dealing with this for a long time. You're right. It won't happen for you. This is for believers. This is for people that will let the seed take root. People that will dare say, God, I agree with what you said, that you will hasten your word to perform it. Lord, I believe for a quick work. I believe enemies are hurrying out of my way. I believe I'm going to see a rapid turnaround. A friend of mine worked for this company where his supervisor wasn't treating him right. He was jealous of him. My friend had a great attitude. I never heard him complain. He just kept doing the right thing even though this supervisor would try to discredit him and make him look bad. This went on for several years. The supervisor was in his early 40s, been with the company almost 20 years. Looked like my friend would always have to deal with this. But one Monday morning, he went to work. The owner of the company called my friend in and said that the supervisor was leaving 
And this owner wanted him to have his position. My friend asked, when was this going to happen? When was he going to leave? The owner said he left last Friday. You're the supervisor starting right now. God knows how to cause people to hurry out of your way, to do things quickly, things that you didn't see coming. That supervisor could have been there another 30 years, but he suddenly left. Here is a thought. Why not call good books and cassettes tapping the treasure of ideas? That's it. Tapping the treasure of ideas like you're doing with this program. 
And if somebody's got a good excuse for not tapping the treasure of ideas for at least 30 minutes every day, or spending the money and getting the books and cassettes, I'd like to hear it. Some excuses you wouldn't believe. I say, John, I've got this gold mine. I've got so much gold, I don't know what to do with it all. Come on over and dig. John says, I don't have a shovel. I say, well, John, get you one. He says, do you know what they want for shovels? Hey, invest the money. Get the cassettes and books. The best money you can spend is money invested in your self-education. Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to investing in your own better future. Mr. Shof got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. So I went to work on my library, and I now have one of the best. Shof recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now, I had a Bible, that's 66 books, so that was a pretty good start, and my parents saw to it that I had a good study of the Bible. But the first book Mr. Shof told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, it's a great one to add to your library. Earl Nightingale has put it on cassette. The title should intrigue you, Think and Grow Rich. I read it several dozen times. Shof said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shof, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. So that was one book he recommended, Think and Grow Rich. The next book he recommended I get was a book on nutrition. Shof said, study nutrition. Vitality plays an important part in doing well. Some people don't do well because they don't feel well. It's not that they're not intelligent, it's that they're ill. They don't have the fire and the vitality to do well. If you're a leader in this room, how many consider yourself a leader in what you do for a living? Let me see your hands. I figure almost everybody. So if you're a leader, that doesn't mean other people follow you, by the way. It just means you live life on your terms. You don't settle for less than you can do or be or share or give. So that's your mindset. Then you got to say, okay, if I'm really going to be a leader in my life, then I need to own my energy, my certainty. I can't just wait till I feel good to do things. I got to be able to get myself to feel good and not phony and not fake. So I'd like to show you as a leader, your skill as a leader, your number one skill that makes you a leader is your ability to influence. Is it true? And who do you have to influence first? That's right. If you can't influence you, you're going to influence somebody else. But your ability to influence the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the behaviors of other people. If you do that, then you will be able to engage the world and yourself. So how do we do that? Well, to influence other people, hear me now, to influence other people, you have to know what already influences them. If you try to get your kid to clean the room the way it would work for you, I promise you it probably doesn't work that way for them. Everyone's different, but there are some universals. And one thing that influences all of us is our state. If you're in a pissed off state, if you ever had a friend do something nice and you're in a pissed off state and you snap at them and you feel bad later on, it was just the state you're in, who knows what I'm talking about here, say ah. So we need to train ourselves to be in a better state. And the second thing that affects what we do long term, besides our state, that's what affects things moment to moment, is we all have a set of beliefs or expectations, or we might call it a blueprint for how life's supposed to be. When life is in alignment with our blueprint, we're happy, we're not, we're upset. So it got to the 10th guy and they called his name and nobody went up. And they called his name again. They said, well, it looks like number 10 is in here. We're going to go to next week's list. Steve Harvey, come on up. I looked at that girl, Gladys. I said, it's crazy. I said, it's somebody in here got the same name I got. <laughs> she said, you really can't be this stupid. <laughs> she said, boy, that's you. And the audience clapped again. It's all white audience. I run up on stage. I ain't got nothing. First thing I say to the audience is, hey, I appreciate y'all clapping, but I ain't supposed to be here. I'm on next week's show. They white. They laugh. <laughs> So I said, no, nah, really, I ain't got nothing for y'all. So the girl Gladys yelled out, tell her about when you was boxing. So on the way down, I had told her this story about boxing. So I did the boxing joke. These, these people was in the flow laughing. So then I had nothing else. So I had wrote some jokes for my buddy A.J. Jamal that I hadn't sold to him yet. So I said, well, hell, let me try to eat. So I did them jokes. They died laughing. They bought me off stage. They bought all 10 of us up on stage. They had a clap off. That night, I won the clap off. I won amateur night, October 8th, 1985. They paid me $50. I get in the car. I'm 40 minutes from my house. Gladys is driving me home. I'm crying the entire time. I can't stop crying. She said, what you crying for? It's just $50. I said, no, you don't understand. This ain't $50. I've been born to you.
the same $50. This is God answering a prayer of mine that I've been praying for 20 years. This ain't $50. This is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I went to work the next day, October 8, 1985, and quit my job. I have done nothing since October 8, 1985, except one thing. I've been telling these here jokes. That's all I've ever done. That gift that God gave me. You know, the Bible says your gift will make room for you. It'll make room for you. See, if you're not doing your gift, you're wasting your time. Maybe when you wake up in the morning, see, but sales is a gift. That dude that keep winning team member of the year from the comfortable background. I had the privilege several years ago, I was invited by these businessmen in South Africa uh, to come over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody here from South Africa? I love it. I love it. Cape Town and Sydney are two of my favorite cities in all the world. But I was over there ministering for a bunch of Christian businessmen who had come into an abundance of wealth and they wanted to submit all that they had into the hands of God and, and they invited me over to talk to them both about business and about faith and just a small group. wasn't a big crowd of people, but it was an amazing time. And, and one of the benefits that they gave me for being over there is one of them had such influence. He said, when you get through working, we're going to take you on a safari. And, and I, being a hillbilly from the sticks in West Virginia, I thought that was pretty cool. And I got real excited. I had my son with me and I had my wife with me. And, and I'd never been on a safari before, so I, I went out and bought me some safari clothes. Because you got to coordinate everything. You got to be looking good when you're out there with the elephants and stuff, you know because they might take pictures of you or something. So I, I looked like I knew what I was doing. I was excited. And they said, we're going to take you over in a little plane and you're going to land on the runway and everything like that. And it's kind of out in a little remote area, but it's going to be cool. And we got on the little plane. I was cool. And my son was cool. And my wife was there. <laughs> Yeah, she was there. She was there. And I was really cool with it because I pictured uh, I pictured a runway with a tower and a control tower and, and everything. There was no control tower anywhere. There was a little runway, just a strip going through the jungle. No lights or nothing on it. And we had to wait before we land because there was a rhinoceros out in the middle of the runway. And all of a sudden, I knew this wasn't going to exactly be like what I had in mind when I started. But I was still cool because the little boy in me is kind of crazy and rough. And I thought, oh, this is going to be good. And my son was down with me. He's ready to go do it. And my wife was just there. They took us out to this, uh, this, it was like a monstrosity of a mansion out in the middle of the jungle. And it was really cool. It was, it was, uh, uh, J. Paul Getty's house. And it was really some place that I couldn't have gone had they not just allowed me to go. And it was wonderful. It was real plush. It was real nice. I was having a good time. So they said, don't go out the, the house at night, you know, be, be, because I, the, the animals are free. Now, you have to understand, in the States, we have animals, but, but they're in cages and stuff like that. And we're free, and the animals are in cages. And so this was an international concept that I was not exactly familiar with. And I decided I was going to go anyway. So my son and I, we put on our outfits, and we got up early that morning, and we said, we're going out on the safari. And they brought this big old Jeep up, and we got on the Jeep. And he said, I said, are you ready? That's what he said, yeah, Dad, I'm ready. We jumped on the Jeep. My wife wasn't there. She felt led of the Lord to stay at home and pray for us. So we got on the Jeep and we're riding out there, you know, and, and it was interesting because the guy who was giving us his tour and going to show us all of these unique animals, I mean, lions and elephants and all of this fantastic stuff. He was a zoologist and it was amazing. It was, it, he, it was amazing because he knew all of this stuff about the animals, how the animals' teeth were cut a certain way so that when they bit into certain branches, the branches were, were cut in such a way that they would be pruned and still be fruitful. It was amazing how smart our God is.